Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, Battleship New Jersey's crew has been invited to the USS Slater, which is currently in dry dock at Cadell's shipyard on Staten Island. She is a World War II era destroyer escort, which is normally open as a museum ship in Albany, New York. In this video, we're going to cover some of the anti-submarine technologies that this ship had during World War II. All of these are weapon systems that Battleship New Jersey herself did not carry. The battleship relied on destroyers and destroyer escorts like Slater to escort her to protect her against submarines. Hopefully by now, you've already seen Tom Hanks' movie Greyhound, which is a, an excellent portrayal of anti-submarine warfare in the North Atlantic during World War II. Slater is one of the ships that actually performed that duty uh, and did a lot of the same sorts of things you saw in that movie. So we're going to go through today and talk about those weapon systems you saw uh, and what they were used for. We are standing on the open bridge of Slater. This is where her commanding officer would have commanded the ship from in battle. The actual helm is in the enclosed bridge beneath us, but from up here, the commanding officer has a good view of what's going on around him. He is connected to below via voice tubes, sound powered phones, uh, and electrical communication circuits. So he can communicate throughout the boat still. Also from up here, he has access to the depth charge launchers, which if you pull one of these, it'll roll depth charges off the stern of the ship, and the sonar shack over there. This is the World War II era sonar shack on board USS Slater. Early developed sonars mounted in the bottom of the ship, and so the sonar shack had to be down there as well. The sonar technician would have to relay to the bridge via sound power telephones or other communication devices. And so there was always a delay between the commanding officer giving his orders uh, and the information he's receiving from the sonar men to make those orders actionable. On these late war built destroyer escorts, the sonar shack, uh, they managed to run the leads to it all the way up to the open bridge. So just about where the camera is right now is the door. So. I, as the sonar operator, can stick my head out that door and tell the captain actionable, live information that I'm picking up from my console. There are two different types of sonar on this ship, active and passive. Passive you could use all the time. That is, you're wearing headsets and you're just listening to the sounds of the ocean. You can pick up sounds of other ships' propellers, of air escaping from ships as submarines dive or surface, uh, and other mechanical noises like torpedo doors opening and the uh, torpedo itself launching. You can go around listening like that and other people don't know you're here except from your own propellers uh, movement. There's also active sonar like this one where you are sending out a ping. And that ping bounces off of the enemy boat and comes back to you. And that gives you really accurate ranging information uh, and directional information too. Problem is everybody in the ocean knows exactly where you are just as well as you know where they are. So if you are protecting a convoy, running around pinging and letting enemy submarines know that you are searching for them is a good idea. If you are a solo ship transiting uh, say you pick up survivors from a lost vessel and you're trying to catch back up with the convoy, maybe you don't want to ping and tell the submarine where you're going, where your convoy currently is. Um, if you are, say, a, a uh, force of warships in the mid-ocean about to launch a strike, you probably don't want to be actively searching for submarines. So this protrusion to the bottom of the ship is the sonar dome. This is where a lot of the sonar equipment for the ship, both passive and active, are mounted. We're at the extreme fan tail of USS Slater. We're
where her two discharge racks are located. This is some of the earliest anti-submarine weaponry developed. It's a really simple system. This is one of several places on the ships where you can pull a lever and it allows a single depth charge to roll off the back of the ship. You preset what depth you want it to explode at and when it senses water pressure at that depth, it will explode. It's a 600 pound Torpex charge, which will create a pressure bubble which hits the pressure hull of an enemy submarine. Oftentimes that's enough to defeat the welding or riveting and open up a hole in the sub causing her to flood and sink. You're dropping this off the stern of the ship so that you can sail away from it so the explosion doesn't damage your own ship too. Problem is, you can't hear the submarine during final approach. So it's real easy for them to maneuver out of the way. Better systems were developed during the war that superseded the stern mounted depth charge racks. This was the last evolution of anti-submarine warfare carried by Slater in World War II. This is a series of K-gun projectors. They would use a powder charge inserted in the base to launch a shoe like this one with a 200 pound teardrop depth charge set on it. You would preset the depth you wanted this charge to go off on. And when the water pressure hit a certain level, the hydrostatic sensor in the nose of this would cause it to explode. Unlike traditional roll-off depth charges where you had to physically go over the submarine, the K-guns project out to the side of the ship. You could fire eight at a time, four to each side in a pattern. And this would have a higher likelihood chance of hitting the submarine. As you come over the boat, you lose sonar of it, and the enemy submarine is going to try and go one way or the other. But whichever way it goes, you've got a K-gun projector dropping on it. Covered up behind me here is the Hedgehog depth charge projector. So this throws specially shaped small charges with contact detonators on the nose ahead of the ship. As a destroyer comes in over a submarine, you can hear the submarine on your sonar. As you get overhead of it, you lose it with your own ship's noise. So many well-executed depth charge attacks were able to be foiled by submarine commanders at the last minute because they would wait to get into the enemy ship's baffles and then veer away. The Hedgehog's introduction led to the destruction of numerous German U-boats and Japanese INR boats because they would continue going straight, waiting for the American ship to get overhead. This would be fired. It would only explode if it contacted the submarine and was just a small charge compared to the 200 and 600 pound depth charges on the fantail. But it was enough to blow a hole in the pressure hull and destroy the boat. If you get an explosion, it means you've hit the boat. If you don't get an explosion, means you've got to reload these for another run. The spigots on this are all angled differently so that the depth charges land in a specific pattern, getting maximum coverage. Thanks for watching. Remember to like, share, and subscribe so you're notified when we put out future content. Cool. Remember, if you have any questions, to drop them in the comment section down below. And if you would like to support Battleship New Jersey, a link to our donation page is in the description below. If you would like to support the Destroyer Escort USS Slater, which we are on in today's video, the description also has a link to her page. This dry docking is funded largely through private donations.